John, thank you so much. Yes, and now a chance to take a rest. And uh, I think we could keep on hearing you, but now we have a chance to converse with you. So I'd like to open up for a question and answer discussion with the audience. We have an online audience too, and our colleague will raise uh, the hand when the online person wants to say. Please just give us your name and institution. Yes. Uh, Tom Timber, consultant. I uh, it, thank you for a lot of stimulating, and as you say, some of them uh, it points that the world has in fact been neglecting. But I wonder how you would uh, respond on your point about modernization in women with the other fact we know, which is the actual labor force in agriculture has become more and more women. That's been the other argument for more extensive extension to them. So how does the increasing role of women as cultivators uh, go with your concern about their uh, disem disempowerment? The increasing role of women as cultivators, how does that essentially fit with the uh, growing role of women in the labor force? Extension agents. Uh, extension agents as well as in the rural labor force. Oh, okay. Well, uh, I think that the, the, the extension agents are extremely important and it has to be public sector. Uh, why? Because you need wide commodity coverage and you need wide geographic coverage. Now, Ethiopia trained 63,000 extension agents in five years. Uh, that's very impressive. Let's not ask any questions about how well trained they were, okay? But all the farmer surveys show that farmers found, find the extension agents very helpful. Uh, now, if they stay at that level of training, farmers won't find them very helpful for very many more years. So they have to be constant in-service uh, training. But I, 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 there, there are so many attacks on trying to show that extension is useless. You, it's hard to know where to start. But uh, one of the most frequent sources of attack is to say, well, most farmers learn from other farmers. That's true, of course. Uh, but it started somewhere, right? <laughs> the, uh, this farmer learned from this one, and then that one learned from this one. Where did they start from? They started with the extension agent. <laughs> now, in a few cases, there may be a big farmer nearby, and he was doing something, and some farmer picked it up, and so on. But if you're talking about national coverage, you have to have a large number of extension agents out there. Now, the other thing I want to say on this is that uh, I keep making the point that initially not very well trained extension agents are very helpful. They have, you have to have, keep training them. Uh, this is a very low cost resource, uh, so that it's just crazy not to make use of it. And uh, the, you, you should be having many more extension agents per PhD researcher in a low-income country than you have here uh, because of the differences in wage levels and so forth and so on. So that one should be doing large-scale extension services, constantly upgrading them. And now, are there other sources of information? I think that's one thing that you're implying. Yes, uh, but the core is from the public sector research system through the extension agents. That's the core of the job. And then all the rest of it is, is very useful uh, add-ons uh, on that. And I, I'm making a big thing of this uh, because uh, the, the foreign aid programs have just ignored extension uh, over the last uh, several years. And they talk about it being low quality and blah, blah, blah. Uh, they never go out and ask farmers what the farmers think about it. And, uh, uh, and what they should be doing is saying, hey, this isn't very high quality extension. They're correct. Why don't they work at improving it? <laughs> That's what should be done. And uh, let, let me just make a general point here. No sector of the economy is more private sector oriented than agriculture. Farmers are private sector. 
the input suppliers are private sector, the marketing agencies are private sector, but no sector of the economy is more reliant on a small but very crucial public sector. And this whole business in foreign aid of just turning away from the public sector and saying everything should be private sector has just destroyed uh, African countries and African poverty reduction. Asian countries don't pay any attention to foreign aid nowadays so that they, they go on the way they were. Uh, but tremendous damage has been done in Africa by this attitude. John, thank you. I think, Tom, we can hopefully come back a little later again in the conversation, but I know on the extension theme, Suresh, you had your hand up earlier. I know you're working on that, so. Okay. Uh, thank you, John, for, for a nice presentation. And I am learning from your work in the past. I mean, I'm not surprised uh, what you are saying. It's all, again, for us, uh, revision of what you have been telling us for several years. But in the context of the extension system, even in places like South Asia, for example, where the public system has, has been destroyed over the years, um, there has been, uh, you talked about the private sector extension. It's now, it's pluralistic. It's not just one public sector extension. In fact, public sector extension has become so inefficient, even if you, you talked about the training aspect of it. You would rather want to have farmers to have direct connections with the private companies which are giving the correct information for, for them. So it's not the emphasis on public versus private. It's how you organize the system of information exchange between the research and the extension group. That's one thing. Then you talked about public extension. I mean, even in Ethiopia, for example, it's extension without messages. Yeah. Do you, you don't have information that this traditional technology transfer approach is still there and that's not going too far talk about malawi you have been in malawi yeah. and you after you give the hybrid seeds and the fertilizers to uh, to apply where is extension you come back after four months and harvest yeah. Yeah. so extension agents are sitting on the, on the tree uh, uh, under the tree shade and drinking alcohol right so that is the inefficiency in the public extension system that we are not talking about so while I'm at it, I want to talk, talk short, about short, sorry, short, short. Question. the capacity in the research system. Even if you give the money right now to the research system to do research, there is no one to do research. The capacity of the research systems have been weakened. And you have been involved in building capacities in the agricultural economics profession. Yeah. But if you look at uh, the national systems right now, we don't have, even if you have money for doing research, there is no capacity to set priorities, there is no capacity to execute the research program. So th that's, a, that's a fundamental yeah. issue right now. John, did you want to comment on the capacity in the research systems being so weak capacity and of capacity of research systems in the countries being so weakened now and uh, the concern <laughs> that the capacity is so weakened? Yeah. Any thoughts on your uh, front from well, that? Let me make a couple of comments now. Uh, I'm speaking the mic. Oh, sorry. Uh, f f first of all, I'm a great believer in competition. <laughs> the more competition in anything, the better. So uh, I make a big pitch for a, a, a national finance system, but commercial banks and, and private other things coming along and providing competition here and there, good thing. Same thing in extension. So that if there are fertilizer companies, for example, that want to do some extension, we should be very happy about that. Now, American farmers are quite happy that there's a public extension system to help keep the private fertilizer people reasonably honest. So uh, uh, we, we, the public sector has a, has a role to play uh, uh, there uh, also. Uh, I, I, I think the... I, I think your basic point is a lack of capacity, basically, right? Uh, yes, that's there. Uh, and what do you do about it? Well, you get to work. <laughs> uh, first of all, you, you spend some money hiring people. And you start out with them not very well trained. And fortunately, uh, the, you know, we, always, we like this business that these are all these wonderful farmers. They're so good at everything and so on. That's a lot of baloney. Uh, uh, farmers in, in traditional agriculture are reasonably good at the day-to-day -day operations, but they're not very good business people because they haven't had much practice at it. So they need some extension uh, help. And if it's not very high quality, it may still be quite helpful to them. So uh, my view is st don't be afraid to go to high numbers. High numbers, of course, mean poorer training. 
Uh, I'd rather have a large number of poorly trained people than a small number of well-trained people. Uh, uh, I mean, first of all, they learn on the job. So there are all sorts of ways that they can help on that. Uh, but the bottom line is, if there's lack of capacity, you better get to work building it. And uh, uh, the faster you do it, the better. And here I would come back to an absolutely crucial point. The core of modernization is a national agricultural research system. That's your first priority. Then you need to, the second thing you need to worry about is, are those research people connected to farmers? And the chances are they're not very well connected. They very often, if you get a PhD in agronomy, the chances that you come from a farm are not very high in a low income country. Uh, so you, 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 you're facing all sorts of problems there and you just have to start hiring and building and, and, and building them up. And the, f the good thing is the farmers aren't very good at it either. So that uh, a, a fairly modestly poor extension service and a so-so research system can still be very helpful, but you better be improving it over time. Huh? From your lips to God's ears. Um, I see Mike's hand there at the back, Pamela. Thanks, I'll stand up. Michael Morris of the World Bank. Um, and, and thank you for, for, you know, not for the first time, um, really sort of reinforcing many of these classic messages that we learned yeah. from you and from others uh, of your generation, I think, that, that really, you know, have resonated with us through all of our careers. One of the things that I was thinking about today was looking at these kind of take-home messages. To what extent are disruptive technologies going to make the future actually different from the past and might sort of um, undercut the value of some of the things that we've learned and we've taken for granted so many years? Uh, a good example is this extension example. Uh, two weeks ago, Michael Kramer of Harvard was at the World Bank giving a seminar about ag extension in Ethiopia with mobile phone delivery systems. And you know the bottom message was it's not quite there yet, but it's going to be there very soon. So we're not going to need the 63,000 extension workers in Ethiopia who may not have valid messages anyway and may spend half their time sitting under the tree during the, while the crop is growing. But to some, I think it would be interesting to go back, maybe this is a comment more than a question, and look at some of these things that we really take for granted and challenge ourselves to think Disruptive technologies that are coming along, are they going to actually undermine the, the value of some of these messages and force us to think of some of these things in new ways? Mike, thank you so much. Are you? I think I understood, understood that. Uh, my, it, it's, it, it's more than just an impression. The most effective extension Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting. Uh, the most effective extension is demonstrations. You go out on a farmer's field and you show exactly how to do it. Uh, and the farmer sees it week after week as it comes along. Uh, I don't see how modern technology is going to increase the efficiency of doing demonstrations. There may be some ways in which the efficiency can go up, but uh, to think that you're going to be able to do demonstrations without any people uh, it seems to me is a little unrealistic uh, in that respect. And don't forget, you're, you're still dealing, certainly in most African countries, a high proportion of the decision makers, the final decision makers, are still illiterate. And uh, it's going to be a t good deal of time before that becomes 5% instead of 90% or 70% or something or other. Uh, so again, you keep coming back to demonstrations. Now, um, in, in my view, demonstrations are way underutilized as it is. Uh, uh, but to think of having even fewer demonstrations and, and, and some high-tech substitute for that, I don't think is very reasonable. Uh, you should always be looking for ways in which technological breakthroughs 
can be used to your advantage or whatever you're doing, whether it's extension or whatever it is. So we need to look at those things and try to use them. And uh, I, I think that one thing they can do is to provide a much more effective backup uh, and continuing memory for demonstrations uh, so that they, in a, in a sense, become an add-on rather than a substitute for, for uh, traditional extension. Now, I'd, I'd like to make a, another side point on this. Uh, I, I've, in working through doing this book, I kept walking up to a conclusion and then saying, no, no, you, you really don't want to conclude that. Uh, I have to conclude that, let's talk about Africa. In African countries, I think anywhere, but in African countries, you're not going to develop agriculture until you have at least moderately democratic governments. Now, I consider the Ethiopian government to be a highly democratic government, and my, my own government completely disagrees with me on that. But the, the leadership in the, polit the ruling political party believes that they need to have massive rural support uh, when they have an election. And, you know, they fiddle with, they put some of the opposition in jail and they do a various other fiddling here and there and so on. But to them, it is important that the rural people be backing what they're doing. And they've been willing to give up something in urban areas for it. And they've probably given up a little bit too much because the urban areas are so much better organized than, than, uh, uh, than, than rural areas. Uh, my, what is my point here? Let me, let me give you an, ex an example from Afghanistan. If in 2002, when we went into Afghanistan, we'd done the right things in agriculture, including having building up the agricultural research system. We just started last year helping the agricultural research system. I don't know what this, is this 10 years or 15 years or something beyond 2002? If we'd built up the agricultural research system and an extension system, you would have had widespread rural support for the legitimate government of Afghanistan. We didn't do that. And you go out in rural areas in Afghanistan and you talk to farmers about the government and they say all the government does is taxes. They don't do anything useful. It's not quite true. The government does a few useful things in rural areas, but not enough to have any impact. If they'd come out there with a research system improved and with a large-scale extension system, they would have had a lot more support. Well, what's my point? My point is that those extension agents, they, they're not supposed to be pimping for the government, but they're government employees, and they're doing the job of the government out there, and that gets government support. And that's one of our biggest problems in countries like Afghanistan. There's no support in the rural areas for the uh, government. That, that's, that's, I think that's true in high proportion of... Uh, African countries, so that I, I, I don't want to be in the position of saying, well, probably extension's useless except politically, so you need to have these guys. That's not my point. But I, it's an important side benefit, and if you're in doubt about an extension system, think about the political benefits. If the government is concerned about rural votes, how many African countries have any concern for the rural vote? Maybe two or three or none, probably. I mean, Rwanda may somewhat, Ethiopia does, of course. I mean, a couple of others, I think, in Ghana, there's some concern, but it's pretty limited. And uh, so, so I think that's very important. Thank you. John, there are several more people who want to ask yeah. questions. Yeah. Um, let me come online first, and then I will come to Sue next. Uh, John, we have an online question. Yes, there are three online questions. Oh, well, take one by one. All right. Oh, dear. Uh, the first is from... I Vid can't remember three, so you'll have to <laughs> remember three. Right. Uh, the first is from Vidoster Ingram from Vingram Enterprises. Can multiple plantings and storage facilities improve outcomes for farmers? Okay. Well, Can we take them one at a time? Yeah. Uh, or, or just take them all three, and all then we'll three. just address okay. which one we all right. can. Okay. All right. Very good. Rob from the Gates Foundation asks, at what level of productivity and production do you see Ethiopia reaching saturation for internally consumed staples? That's the second question. And the final question from Gary Atlin is, the key factor in increasing yields in Ethiopia has been inorganic fertilizer, mainly nitrogen. 
the Ethiopian government has made fertilizer much more widely available to smallholders. How is this done? Okay. okay so I didn't get those at yeah. all. Um, two of the questions pertain to Ethiopia, if I got that correct. One of them was on fertilizer and the government of Ethiopia making fertilizers available uh, much more with inorganic fertilizers being a key constraint. Yeah. And uh, Ethiopia has invested availability in of availability yeah. of fertilizer. Yeah. And the question before that was at what level of production or productivity uh, can Ethiopia reach saturation point for locally produced uh, staples? Did I get that right, John? Internally consumed staples. So essentially both questions pertain to Ethiopia, the which I think... Saturation of fertilizer use? Uh, one, no. One was on uh, access to... Fer sorry, making fertilizer available yeah. and the role that played in Ethiopia. Right. And the other one is on productivity in Ethiopia for internally consumed staples. Are we at saturation point for productivity increases yeah, in Ethiopia? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> If if we did a, a study, uh, sorry, I keep forgetting this thing. Uh, if we did a study of the uh, uh, fertilizer industry in Ethiopia and concluded that uh, uh, that Ethiopia was subsidizing fertilizer substantially, and uh, uh, I say at the least that was an extremely misleading conclusion, uh, that uh, countries like Kenya subsidize fertilizer in the way that we usually use the term subsidy that the government picks up a hunk of the, of the price of the fertilizer. Uh, in the case of Ethiopia, uh, they followed a lot of policies uh, to ensure fertilizer ava availability, and those policies had some costs, uh, and those were counted as subsidies just like the, uh, like the Kenyan one. And I, in my view, that's very misleading. Uh, uh, the government should be following policies that increase the supply of fertilizer and so on. Now, what the Ethiopian government did uh, was to import substantially more fertilizer by a large amount than was consumed the year before. They shoved this fertilizer out to the cooperatives, and the cooperatives shoved the fertilizer down to the local level. And it was signif always significantly more fertilizer than the local people wanted to consume. But they had a huge problem. The people running the co-op had this bloody fertilizer on their hands. What, what were they going to do with it? Well, the obvious thing to do is to try and shove it out and try and get farmers to buy more than they intended otherwise. So that you had a very strong supply push on fertilizer. Now, that has some costs because there were, there were bound to be some more carryover costs involved in that and so on. But it seems to me that's a sensible role for the government. If fertilizer is the core of your growth, which it's, has been the case in, uh, in Ethiopia uh, pretty much, uh, if that's been the core of your growth, uh, the, it, it makes sense uh, to undertake some public expenditures to ensure that there's an ample supply of fertilizer out there somewhat more carryover stocks than the private sector would do on its own. Uh, so that the, what I would say in Ethiopia is they worked hard to push out fertilizer and get it used at the full market price for the fertilizer, but the government uh, uh, co covering the, the costs of, of the supply push on it. So I, in my view, that was a very sensible uh, set of policies. Now. The e Ethiopia, you know, the, the, one of the appalling things about Ethiopia, they've had this tremendous growth rate. Poverty's dropped in half, uh, but still a quarter of the rural people are under the poverty line, and it's a very low poverty line. Uh, so, the, and, and they started out with very low yields. So there's, there's still a, a, a half a dozen or so years left of of catch-up growth. And by the way, all this 6% growth rate stuff in agriculture is only possible because you're catching up with what other people are doing. We don't grow at 6% in the U.S., and we have a much better research system than Ethiopia has. Uh, uh, well, it's a little harder to grow once you get up there. Uh, so they're doing a lot of catch-up uh, growth, and they haven't finished catching up yet. They still have a ways to go on it. Uh, on that. So I think they have another half, half dozen years of, 
uh, reasonably rapid growth in, in uh, cereals production. But it gets harder that the stuff that got you 6% growth rate 10 years ago, uh, you need to make much more effort to do 6% now and even more in the, f in the, uh, in the future. Now, w w what happens next? The, the major export crops have had very little increase in productivity. Uh, so there's a lot of scope for swinging their research in that direction. Uh, the uh, urbanization is increasing. The demand for livestock and horticulture products, products is growing at about 8% a year. So there's a lot of scope for increasing there. It's not clear to me at this point that the government is making the sufficient changes in its approach to agriculture to take advantage of these opportunities. So what you're saying is, are they running out on what they were doing? Well, yes, they're getting close to running out on what they're doing, but there are a lot of other things to do. Are they making the changes? Are they, uh, you, you don't want to cut back on your, on your cereals uh, research, but are they doubling their research budget over the next two or three years so they can handle the export crops and the, and the uh, livestock and horticulture? Uh, I'm not sure that they are. So they may, Ethiopia may slow down, but that's not necessary. Uh, it's because they, they, they misjudged the situation uh, uh, somewhat. So I, I would say that in a country like Ethiopia, there's at least another 20 to 30 years of 6% growth left, but they have to adapt their systems to the changing situation, and maybe they're not doing that now. John, I know that so many people would like to continue to ask, but I'm also aware of the uh, time constraint. Um, how about we formally close in a moment, and then you can continue to interact with people. But before I formally close, let me ask you, what's next? What is the next book you're working on? <laughs> well, I think I have one more book left in me, and I'm, I, I, I'm trying to... Uh, uh, I, I, I want a month in Bellagio from the Rockefeller Foundation for the next <laughs> one. Speaking to the so, mic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Speaking to the mic. I, I don't know whether I'm going to get that or not, uh, so we'll see. Well, no, but I'll make a serious comment here. It's very important to me that Africa succeed because I want to write the final book on how the whole Asia-African situation succeeded. And I can't do that until Africa does a little bit better. And I, and, uh, uh, I probably don't, I'm, I'm 90 now, so I'm, I'm not sure I have another, more than another 10 years left of active, uh, active research. Uh, so I, I want them to hurry up in Africa on that. Uh. John, you are an inspiration to many of us. So thank you so much for sharing your new book with us. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know